Shri La Prabhupada Ki. When Sri La Prabhupada came to the West, we did not know anything about Lord Nityananda. We did not know anything about anything, actually. When Prabhupada started the Hare Krishna movement, he called 26 Second Avenue, the first ashram, a spiritual kindergarten. Maybe you've heard the recordings. Prabhupada is singing. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And then you see his first followers trying to follow. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna. And why are they chanting? Many of them are chanting because they want to stay high forever. That's the motive. And Prabhupada knew that. Prabhupada knew that the motive was looking for the ultimate high, but he knew that the chanting would purify them of that motive. After chanting for a couple of months, one of his first followers said to Swamiji, as they called him, uh, Swami, he was an English professor. And he said, Swamiji, I've been chanting Hare Krishna for a couple of months now, and I still haven't seen the universal form. <laughs> because that's what they were seeing on LSD, so they thought, if you chant Hare Krishna, you should see it more. So Prabhupada always knew um, the right answer, because he not only knew the content of the question, he knew the intent of the questioner. <laughs> so Prabhupada's simple answer was, uh, that's all right, you keep chanting, keep chanting, it'll go away, you know, your desire to see the universal form. So to prepare for this little talk, I went through the Bhaktivedanta Veda base, and I noticed that Prabhupada, he only gave two full lectures on Lord Nityananda. Uh, well, one full lecture, actually the first was 1969. Prabhupada was in Los Angeles. And uh, we just inaugurated, we just launched the cultural dance center across the way there. And uh, so Prabhupada, he was determined not only to give us philosophy, but to give us a whole culture. Music, philosophy, food, friends, books, everything. Complete package. So in January 1969 in Los Angeles, Prabhupada sat down and he sung songs of the Vaishnava Acharyas all month and he spoke purports. So that's how we first found out about Lord Nichananda from Prabhupada's purport to Nitai Padakamala, which I've been hearing in the temple compound all day. People have been singing it. So I'd like to, what I'd like to do is share with you the way Prabhupada purported that song. And also, first of all, Jai Jagannath, lead us. First of all, lead us in the singing of Nitai Padakamala in the way we learned those bhajans. So, I'm going to ask you, if you do have the songs of the Vaishnava Acharyas on your app, if you have an app. If you don't have an app, maybe you already have the app in your head, in your heart. That's the best app, right? It's, so, here we go. I think I'll just clap. We'll do it a cappella. We'll clap and we'll sing. And then I'll speak Prabhupada's purport, and then I'll also share with you how Prabhupada added to that purport. Uh, eight years later, in 1977, Prabhupada's last year with us, he was in Bhubaneswar uh, on the 2nd of February, 77, and he gave a, cla he gave a class on Nichananda's appearance day. So, here we go. <clears throat>
Itai Pada Kamala Koti Chandra Shushitala Nitai Pada Kamala Jaya Hai Jagat Jura Jaya Hai Eno Nitai Bine Bhai Radha Krishna Pahi Tenahai Dridha Kori Dharo Nitai Pahai Dridha Kori Say some bandana hijar, Britta Jan Mangelo Tai. Say Pashu Borodura Chai. Say Pashu. Nitai na boli lo muke, maji lo sang sara suke. Vidya kule he kikori beta. Ahankari mata hoya Nitai pada pasoriya Asatye rehe satya kori mani Nitayer Karuna Habe, Raja Radha Krishna Pabe. Dharo Nitai Charana Dukani. Nitaye Sharana Satya Tahara Seva Kanitya Nitai Pada Sadakoro Asha Narottam boro duki Nitai mori koro suki Rakaranga charanera pasha Rakaranga Charanirupas Rakaranga Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare 
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai So now we're going to read the translation that Srila Prabhupada gave us. You can follow along. The lotus feet of Sri Nityananda are as cool as millions of moons. The whole universe gets peace by the shade of those lotus feet. Without the mercy of Sri Nityananda, nobody can get Radha and Krishna, the aim of human life. Therefore, catch hold of the two lotus feet of Sri Nityananda Prabhu very tightly. One who has not established a relationship with Sri Nityananda is a two-legged animal, a great beast. His whole life is finished. He cannot be called a human being. He never utters the name of Sri Nityananda. He is always immersed in enjoying material happiness and has forgotten Sri Nitai. He may have acquired all material scholarship and learning, but what is the value of such education? This will never help. They are so puffed up with their mundane education and scholarship, they are never humble at all. They have forgotten the lotus feet of Sri Nitai because of their false ego and pride. They are completely under the clutches of Maya. They accept the untruth as truth. If Sri Nityananda showers his mercy upon someone, he will get Sri Sri Radha and Krishna in Brajabhumi. So, catch hold of the two lotus feet of Lord Nityananda very tightly. The lotus feet of Sri Nityananda are eternally true. And those followers or servants of those lotus feet of Sri Nityananda are also eternal. Always aspire for the lotus feet of Sri Nityananda. Srila Narottam Das Thakur says, I am very distressed and an unhappy person. I am drowning in this dreadful ocean of material existence. O oh, Sri Nityananda Prabhu, please make me very happy. Please keep me at your lotus feet. Jai. Srila Narottam Das Thakur Ki Jai. So Prabhupada, he gave that translation and then in, his, in the quiet of his room, he gave uh, purports. So I'd like to share with you highlights of how he spoke the purport because Prabhupada had a way of being very heavy and very sweet. Just like the last time I saw Srila Prabhupada was in Los Angeles, 1976. We did not know it was the last time. We had no idea it was the last time but it was the last time. He came to LA for 10 days because it was the, it was like the, the Western World Headquarters at that time. So after about a week of Prabhupada being there, I was serving at the BBT. 
and my roommate was uh, Devamrita Brahmachari. Does Devamrita Maharaj ever come here? No? Okay, well he's a great speaker and um, writer and preacher now based in uh, New Zealand and he preaches in Australia too. So he was the proofreader of Prabhupada's books and I was the indexer, Jaya Dwaita Brahmachari, who's in Bangalore area now. He was the editor, he was the chief editor. So um, I was the caboose on the train. They would all get the copy that Prabhupada would dictate. He would dictate the translation and purports and then it would come to LA, it would be transcribed and then it would be printed and then Jayadwada Brahmachari, he would be the first one to see it. And then he would have questions for Prabhupada about what was actually the meaning, what was being said. He wanted to make sure he got the grammar right. And then it was given to Devamrita Brahmachari to proofread. And then they gave it to me to index. So, and they always wanted the index yesterday, right? the way we put it, because I was the last guy. And so it, and that was before computer programs. I, we, I just did it by hand. I had a typewriter and then I put the car, index cards in the slots, in this alphabetized cardboard slots. <laughs> so it was quite a challenge. So anyway, Prabhupada came. And wherever Prabhupada came, he always had a way of turning everything upside down because he knew we needed shaking up. So uh, this was 76 June. He was there from June 1 to June 11. And one of the ways he turned the place upside down was he, uh, he had, the previous year, he had had his famous BBT marathon. Maybe you've heard of this famous 17 books in two months marathon. He had come the previous year and the, the BBT was behind, 17 books. And Prabhupada said, I'm not very inspired to keep translating if you people aren't going to publish timely. I'm way ahead of you. This famous morning walk in, uh, along the Pacific Ocean, Venice Beach, California. So um, Prabhupada's talking like this. I'm not going to translate. Keep translating if you don't keep up with me. And so two of the BBT managers were there, Ramaswara Maharaj and Radha Balaba Prabhu. So they heard Prabhupada say this and then so they came up to the front where Prabhupada was and they said, Srila Prabhupada, we have just figured out that if we work really hard, we can publish um, one of your books now every two months. And so Prabhupada looked at them and said, 17 books in two months. <laughs> and so just reflexively, spontaneously, Ramaswara blurted out, but Srila Prabhupada, that's impossible. And then Prabhupada said the famous, impossible is a word in a fool's dictionary. And they were stunned, they were shocked that Prabhupada was serious. So he stopped in his tracks along with Radha Balava, and they just stood in the sand. And they realized that we have actually have to do this. We have to produce 17 books in two, that's like more than two books a week. It's like insane. But Prabhupada said, we can do it. Impossible is a word in a fool's dictionary. He's empowering us to do it. So as soon as their mood changed from impossible to possible, then immediately they got flooded with ideas how to do it. So the way they did it was, they had a complete 24-7 marathon. The devotees worked in shifts, and they recruited, I remember this, I was serving at the time in Gainesville, Florida, and uh, there was an all-points bulletin out. It was, the BBT was calling for anybody with any proofreading or editing experience or any artist who wanted to help paint paintings really fast to help the BBT artists, please come to Los Angeles. Srila Prabhupada has ordered us to publish 17 books in two months. 
So they came. A lot of these people came. And it was round the clock. There was, uh, and the devotees were allowed to do two things, the people who were involved in the marathon. You were allowed to sleep, to get your six hours of sleep. You were allowed to take prasadam. Uh, and you were allowed to chant your rounds. Everything else was out the window. And then you just went, got to work. So they did it. They actually did 17 books in two months, two months, and they finished in uh, like, it was like August, September, 75. So by the time I got to the BBT in January, 76, the devotees who were still in the BBT then, they were still speaking in very hushed tones about the rush. The rush, that's what they called, that's what they called the marathon, the rush. Now, some of those people, it was, it was, there was the entire Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita and the entire fifth canto. So, some of the devotees who had been involved in producing those CC volumes after Prabhupada left, after all, they were the first people to see all these intimate pastimes of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So when I got to LA, one of the first things that happened was some of these BBT people invited me to a CC reading. And I hadn't even read CC yet because it had just come out. So I thought, oh, this is nice. I'll go to a CC reading. I'll get to, I'll get to hear Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita in the company of devotees who produced the books. So I went, but as soon as I went to the meeting, I knew something was funny because I was hearing people minimizing the value of Bhagavad Gita. And I was a, Brahm I was a young brahmachari. I was memorizing the Gita. I was making it mine. You know, it was my, I was up to about the 13th chapter, memorizing all the slokas. And so when I heard this, you know, oh Prabhu, you know, the Gita is just about, it's just the ABCs, Prabhu. It's just about the modes of nature. This is the real nectar. And of course, what were they talking about? Krishna and the gopis. So long story short, Prabhupada came in June and the BBT managers had been trying to stop these devotees from just holding secret meetings just to focus on Gopi Bhava. They were thinking that they were becoming gopis. And of course, the ladies at the BBT also had their group. It was a, it was a, a, a real live Sahaja weed right in the heart of Prabhupada's movement, right in his BBT. Prabhupada said, his kind's my body, the BBT's my heart. So Prabhupada came to town in June and he started hearing things about this. And then one morning, the second or third day Prabhupada was there, he was just about to take his breakfast after giving the morning class and his servant, Hari Shauri Prabhu, who writes those nice diaries, had, had uh, just brought in his breakfast. There was some dried fruit and nuts. And then Prabhupada had just started to take the first handful of dried fruit and nuts. Prabhupada's Sanskrit editor, Prajumya Prabhu, my godbrother, Prabhupada called him Pandaji, he ran in Prabhupada's room and without paying obeisances or anything, he said, Srila Prabhupada, I've just, I just met the leader of this CC study group and he was minimizing the value of Bhagavad Gita. Prabhupada, that morsel of prasadam never reached Prabhupada's mouth. He put it down, slammed his hand on the desk and said, call all the leaders at once. Call this leader, call the leaders of this study group. Call all the visiting sannyasis and GBCs. We're going to settle this right now. That's what Prabhupada always did. He settled things right now. And so people came. 
And uh, because Prabhupada wanted the leaders to observe how he was dealing with us, with this Sahajya weed. So the, what's the first thing Prabhupada says when they're all seated in front of him? He looks at the leaders of this study group and he says, why are you jumping like monkeys? That's, that's how he starts, right? Why are you jumping like monkeys? But the leaders of this group were so smitten, they were so intoxicated with the notion that they were becoming gopis, they said, but Srila Prabhupada, you said this is topmost. It's right in your books. This is the topmost relationship with Krishna. And immediately Prabhupada shot back, but are you topmost? You can't even chant Hare Krishna properly. You're in the bodily concept of life. But Prabhupada, this is in your books. We're not reading other people's books. This is your books. And then Prabhupada said, my books are like a drugstore. And Prabhupada, of course, you know, was a pharmacist, right? In his householder days. When you go to a drugstore, you can't just demand any drug in the shop. You have to have a prescription from the doctor specific for your disease. So my prescription for you is first Kurukshetra Leela, Bhagavad Gita, then Rasa Leela. First deserve, then desire. So famous quotes came out of this meeting. I wasn't in the room, but I got briefed on it afterwards by a friend of mine who was in the, in the meeting. So Prabhupada just swiftly, decisively uprooted that Sahaja weed. And other things too, Prabhupada you know, was very heavy about. So after about a week of Prabhupada being there, giving wonderful classes, I got to go on two morning walks and it was just wonderful. But it was also very heavy. So after about a week of Prabhupada being in the neighborhood, I mean, he was in his rooms in New Dwarka Temple, Los Angeles Temple, and I was across the street. We were in our BBT little cubicles apartment. So after about a week, I turned to Devamrita and I said, Hey, Devam, isn't this great? Prabhupada's been here a whole week. I don't know how much longer I can take it. Doesn't that sound strange? What did I mean? What did I mean? Well, Prabhupada's Sangha, his association, was like a very hot but a very sweet chutney. Too hot to bear, but too sweet to resist. And that's why in Prabhupada's time with us, I didn't get close to Prabhupada at all. I kept my distance because I knew how foolish I was and I didn't want to commit offenses. So I kept my distance. I mean, someone like Hari Shari Prabhu, he was on what they called the bell. You know, Prabhupada would ring his bell. And when Prabhupada rang his bell, whether it was two in the morning or two in the afternoon, you had to you had to spring up and be there, like in, within seconds. So I wasn't on the bell, I was across the street, you know, doing my BBT service. And, but that was the, the potency of Prabhupada's presence, just to be in the same neighborhood as Srila Prabhupada. You felt obliged, you felt compelled to live at a pitch of Krishna consciousness that maybe you weren't used to where it was really Krishna, 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 24 hours a day. There was no room for any gross or subtle maya, as you know, we were all haunted by being Westerners. So, uh, yeah, I just actually threw out my entire talk that I prepared, but I should maybe say a couple of things. Let me look at my notes. Yeah. So Prabhupada is saying, oh yeah, Shila, uh, Prabhupada is talking about Srila Narottam Das Thakur, how his songs 
who are as good as Veda. This is Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. <coughs> and the way Prabhupada introduced us to Krishna consciousness was through song. Because we were from the counterculture of the 1960s and we were immersed in rock music and rock operas and, and the Beatles, frankly. And it was Chris's arrangement that they had a darshan with Prabhupada. Jai Jagannath. So he was spoon feeding us the philosophy through the, uh, the very deep but simple Bengali language songs of Narottam Das Thakur. And Narottam is saying, Nitai Pada Kamala Koti Chandra Shushital, that the lotus feet of Lord Achananda are they're more cooling than millions of moons. So Prabhupada says, just like if somebody's working all day, say in, outside in the sun, and he's, it, he becomes very fatigued, but he comes home and evening is there, and say it's a full moon, and he becomes very re, much relief in the shelter of the, of the moonlight. So we could all relate to that. And then Prabhupada says, Nityananda, it means eternal pleasure. So in the song, Nurottam Das is saying, that without knowing Lord Nityananda, se pashu boro durachar, we become, we become like beasts, we remain beasts. Dvipada pashu, the Bhagavad says, two-legged animals. And why don't we approach Lord Nityananda? It's because I'm too proud of you know, my birth. Prabhupada was always very fond of making fun of us Americans because he knew we were proud of our highways and our cars and our TVs and our skyscrapers. But he would always remind us that none of that can actually help you. That's all just stuff that's, if you're proud of it, that it's going to get in the way of your march back to Godhead. But it's also a lot of assets you can use in Krishna's service. I, during that visit in June 76, he said, uh, So Krishna is anuraniyan, he's smaller than the smallest, as super soul. Mahato Mahiyan, he's bigger than the biggest, as Mahavishnu, breathing out universes. And uh, he can make, it's like, here's a, here's a way Prabhupada would make fun of us. So you have these big jumbo jets that he was flying around on, 747s, jumbo jets. So can you make jumbo jets that they will never crash? Like, but Krishna can because Krishna is in the heart of all these mosquitoes that are flying around the lights. They make the lights to attract them, and none of them crash. So can you make a jet like that? And we're going, no. <laughs> Which reminds me of Prabhupada arriving in Dallas, Texas, 1972, at Love Field. And so that's where we would usually see Prabhupada, the first and the last, coming in. Uh, on, on the airways. And then so at this particular landing, the devotees ushered Prabhupada right into a VIP room, right in the airport. And Prabhupada went in and they had this makeshift dais, this makeshift Vyasasana. And Prabhupada just hopped up on the seat and he didn't say Hare Krishna. He didn't say thank you for coming. He just said this. So... There are three ways to fly. That's how he starts. There are three ways to fly. And so I was standing next to a reporter from the Dallas Morning News, which is the biggest paper in the Southwest, in Texas. And so I can see her writing, three ways to fly. <laughs> and these reporters, they cover these events for an angle to sell the paper. So she was there to, she was assigned to cover this Swami coming in. So naturally they want to get some angle, something sensational, right? Uh, yeah, so three ways to fly. So Prabhupada said, first there is mantra. 
Formerly the yogis knew the art. By vibrating mantra, they could dip in uh, the Ganga, the Ganges in Haridwar, and they come out hundreds of kilometers later in Allahabad, just by vibrating mantra. So my godbrother, the late great Sada Puta, scientist who wrote many books and whose uh, plans for the uh, Vedic planetarium is still being used by the devotees as they build the TOVP. So he once explained to me how the yogis can do this. He said, because the yogis are uh, pleasing the super soul by their tapas and they contact the super soul. And if their desire is, say, to travel, uh, then the super soul who is in every atom, in every point in space, he can transport them. In the West we have this thing, Star Trek, I don't know if, you know, beam me up, Scotty, like that. So it's like, it's, it's better, it's the super soul. You don't need machines. So Prabhupada said, simply by vibrating mantra, the yogis were, you know, chanting mantras in contact with the super soul and uh, they could instantly go from Haridwar to Allahabad. Boom! No, like, no time. And then Prabhupada said, <laughs> he said, and then there was pigeon. Now, you have pigeons here and we have pigeons in America. Pigeons are all over the world. But there's a word in the Bhagavatam, I think it's kapota. It's, it's a bird that actually, if they fly in formation, they can carry human beings, you know, like a magic carpet, right? So but Prabhupada said pigeon. And of course the reporter, well first the reporter's writing down mantra, and then she writes pigeon. <laughs> and of course she's thinking of <laughs> Pigeon. <laughs> and then and then there is machine. You know, yantra machine. So she raises her hand. She interrupts Prabhupada. She said, uh, so Swam, uh, Swami, were these ways to fly more efficient than today's jumbo jets? You know, because we're very proud of our jumbo jets. So so Prabhupada said, oh yes, oh yes. Right. And then he says, for one thing there were no, and then he couldn't find the right word. So he leaned over to Satsarup Maharaj and he said, how you say that Satsarup? Jack highs? Hijacks Prabhupada, hijacks. <laughs> yes, there were no hijacks. Now Prabhupada was up on the news. The first sky, they call it skyjack, hijacking a plane had just happened because in 1972 um, you know the Arabs and the Israelis are always fighting right so there was this thing called PLO Palestine Lib Liberation Organization they had just done this horrendous terrorist act they had just gone into the Olympic Village in Munich Germany during the Summer Olympics and they had murdered in cold blood all the Israeli athletes and to get away, they hijacked the plane. And, and Prabhupada was up on the news because he knew how to use the news to preach. So he said, there were no skyjacks, you know, hijacks, right? So the reporter was not to be outdone because she was a heavy duty, you know, journalist and she wanted her scoop. She wanted to, you know, they always want to make people look bad because bad news sells, right? So, so she, so, so she said, well, Swami, because Dallas, Texas is a hub for American Airlines, it's their base. Well, Swami, if you know all these ways to fly, why did you fly American Airlines today? She thought she had him, right? Without missing a beat, Prabhupada said, to be one with you. <laughs> and the lady was startled. And she turned to me and she said, you know, I like that man. 
We call it crazy questions, perfect answers. <laughs> that's the thing, Prabhupada, he knew just what to say. So, and that's why when you read, if, if you read Prabhupada, if you read like transcripts of interviews or if you hear him on tapes, you'll hear him say diametrically opposite things to different people. Don't be confused by that. It's all about time, place, and person. It's very important in understanding Prabhupada's vani, the record of his, of his everlasting vibration. So, Prabhupada was introducing us to Lord Nichinanda. I'm just going to check the time. Oh, you do have a clock here. Okay. So, uh, I was sharing with uh, Svayam Prakash Prabhu that there was once a temple in America. There's a town in the heartland of America. It's called St. Louis, Missouri. Have you heard of St. Louis? Okay. So, there was a devotee who was president of the temple and he was very inspired by Prabhupada's preaching about Lord Nityananda. So he decided to turn the whole temple into a Nityananda temple. And he was, because he was inspired by Lord Nityananda, because we're hearing in the song, without, you know, if you don't get the mercy of Lord Nityananda, without develop, say sambandha nahiyar, if you don't develop a, a relationship with Lord Nityananda, you can't really know Lord Chaitanya. And you won't be able to, and without knowing Gorni Thai, you can't enter into uh, Krishna's dancing party, Prabhupada said. So the president was turning all his uh, devotees in the temple into Nityananda Bhaktas. And whenever they'd go to a festival, like we'd all meet at Rathayatras, you know, and, and different, yeah, mostly Rathayatras, then they would. Uh, this devotee and his, his uh, temple devotees, they would just go up to all the devotees from the different temples and they would say, Prabhu, without getting the mercy of Lord Nityananda, your life is spoiled. So you must worship the lotus feet of Lord Nityananda. And they were just like, you know, we say buttonhole people, you know, just sort of be very heavy about it. And so we appreciated that they were inspired by Lord Nityananda, but the way they were doing it was a little weird, you know, it was strange. It was a little fanatic. And so the temple president wasn't get, getting much of a response from the devotees in America. So he was disappointed. So he wrote Prabhupada a letter and said, Srila Prabhupada, I'm very inspired by Nitai Pada Kamala and your purport to the song and your preaching about Lord Nityananda. But the devotees just don't seem to understand. So, <laughs> Prabhupada was very diplomatic with the devotee. It is very nice that you're appreciating the mercy of Lord Nityananda. It's a fact that without their mercy, we cannot understand Radha Krishna and Kali Yuga. But if you want to, and then he turned and he said, if you want to emphasize anyone, Better to emphasize your spiritual master. Because Lord Nityananda is an incarnation of Lord Balaram, who's Krishna's first expansion. He's the original guru. He's the first go-between be between Krishna and all the jivas and everyone else, including Vishnu, Shvangsa and Vibhinamsa. Just like Mahavishnu, right? He, you know, he stole those... Uh, the sons of the Brahmin, just so Krishna and Arjun could go to see him, uh, just because he wanted to see Krishna. So anyway, um, so Srila Prabhupada is the, the greatest modern representative of Lord Nityananda. Just like Lord Nityananda, he was hurt by Jagai Madai in that pastime. It appeared to draw blood, and Mahaprabhu was about to kill them with his chakra. And it was Nitai that said, don't kill them. If you kill them, you'll have to kill everybody in Kali Yuga. Because everybody in Kali Yuga is of the quality of Jagai and Madai. So then Lord Chaitanya relented. So Prabhupada, in that mood of Lord Nityananda, he cared to come across the ocean. 
Sadhus don't traditionally, didn't traditionally cross the ocean to associate with people like me. Outside Vedic culture, completely immersed in all the sinful activities. But Prabhupada is not content to let everybody rot like the materialistic yogis. He's in the mood of Prahlad Maharaj, who said, I'm very happy, Lord Nisringadev, for myself, but I'm simply, uh, I have anxiety for these poor fools who are rotting in the material world. I don't really want to go back to Godhead unless I can take them with me. So that's Prabhupada's mood. He's in the mood of Lord Nityananda. So, let's see. What else? Hmm. So there's a line in Nitai Padakamala, Nitai Charana Satya, Tahara Sevaka Nitya. So the lotus feet of Lord Achananda, Narottam Das Thakur sings, they're not like our feet. There's an expression in English, feet of clay. Feet of clay means there's a tendency we have in this world to worship. Even if we're, even atheists have a tendency to, tendency to worship other great people. It's just the nature of the ashrita, jiva, the one who's looking for shelter, is to try to find shelter with, with if it's not God, it's going to be somebody else. So, um, my god brother Ravindra Swarup Prabhu, very good writer and philosopher, uh, so he was in graduate school at Temple, Temple University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And then he read Prabhupada's books. He was pursuing philosophy. And then he read Prabhupada's books. And he became totally thrilled that, wow, this is, this is the highest philosophy. Next to, the, next to this, these Western philosophers look like kids like children, speculators, just, trying, just making things up and juggling words. But this is solid reconciliation of all the contradictions of life. And so he was so thrilled, he went to his teachers in graduate school, and he went to his faculty advisors, and he was trying to present them, a chintya beta beta tattva, as the cream of philosophy, as the highest expression of philosophy. And he expected that they'd also be excited. But because of their mentality of being too proud, as Narottam says here, they couldn't accept that this was something better than what they had. And so they said to William, William Deadweiler, uh, the Ravinder Sarup said, so my faculty advisor said to me, believe me, Bill, they all, they meaning all these gurus, swamis, and yogis, they all have feet of clay. They're not, they're not uh, you know, what you think they are. They all have some weakness. They all have some fault. Feet of clay. Yeah. So Ravindra realized at that point, hmm, they really can't enter into these texts unless they become a little humble. Right? Tadvidhi pranipatena pariprasnena sevaya. So we're so fortunate that we uh, are appreciating Srila Prabhupada and Lord Nityananda by the example of Srila Prabhupada. If you've seen any of our, my generation, the first generation of Prabhupada's followers, describe what it was like to first see Prabhupada. Many of them have an experience that I had. We always saw him in an airport. And it's a good thing it was, you know, pre-9-11, pre pre-terrorist days, because we never could do now what we did then. We just took over the airport. Tsunami-like kirtans. Just everybody, just airport workers, businessmen, they all just like struck with wonder as we took over the whole, the whole area, the whole gates, with this oceanic kirtan that was vibrating off the walls. So I first saw the, saw the Prabhupada. I joined his movement in July 1970, and then in July 71, 
uh, I was living in New Vrindavan, and uh, the leader said, I think you're ready for initiation, but Prabhupada's not coming to New Vrindavan, so let's go to Detroit, Michigan, you know where they make the cars, where Henry Ford mass produced the cars. And uh, we will see Prabhupada there, and you can get initiated. So wherever Prabhupada went, it wasn't just the local devotees who were there, but people came in from Ontario, Canada, and the Midwest, and we came from New Vrindavan. About a hundred of us came, which was pretty big then. So we went to the airport, Detroit Metro Airport, and Prabhupada was coming from Los Angeles, and the plane was late. And the kirtan was just building and building and with anxiety. Where is Srila Prabhupada? The plane finally lands. People start coming in through the gate. But no Prabhupada. Where is Prabhupada? Because they actually rooted Prabhupada through another place. They knew that uh, there was some message at the airport that there's a Swami on board this plane and all of his followers are waiting for him. So you let him come in through another way so he, he won't it won't be a big mob, right? So we were all waiting. Where's Prabhupada? Where's Prabhupada? And then I knew finally Prabhupada must be close by because I saw all these devotees, whole phalanxes of devotees, and they were like going like this. <laughs> they were just bowing down in mass in big lines. And I said, Where's Prabhupada? And then it happened to me, because I saw Prabhupada coming up an escalator. And myself, and a devotee who became uh, Satya Narayan Prabhu, who is in charge of the uh, Middle East and Far East BBT now. And uh, another devotee, uh, John Tibbets, who became Indra Jumna, who is Indra Jumna Maharaj now. We are charter members of the Floaters Club. What does that mean? Well, we swear that when Prabhupada was there, he wasn't walking, he was floating. <laughs> so anyway, we, I saw Prabhupada floating up the escalator, and the same thing happened to me. Something hit the back of my leg, and I also went, <laughs> Why? Because in one person, what did I see? Absolute power manifesting through absolute humility. You don't see that in the material world. You don't see that. Just like the poem Prabhupada wrote on the Jaladuta, that's what we're going to be looking at, by the way. If you're able to come tomorrow morning, 9.30, we're going to start this lesson, 9.30 to 11. And we're going to start with, with that poem Prabhupada wrote on the Jaladuta. Prabhupada is super empowered by all the previous acharyas, by Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, by the Goswamis. He's totally surrendered to them. So you see all that power being manifested transparently by a completely humble person. And it just knocks you down. Bow down, mister. Yeah. So, so that was, um, I'm telling this because people keep approaching me and they say, well, Prabhu, you're giving this nice seminar series, but will you please tell us how you came? Because that's all people want to know. How did you come? Right? What inspired you? So, of course, it was His Divine Grace. And a big message of this series is that Prabhupada isn't just for 4,000 780 people who happened to take diksha from him between 1966 and 1977. When Prabhupada would be, when interviewers would interview Prabhupada and they'd say, who are you? Prabhupada never said, oh, my name is Bhaktivedanta Swami and I am the, I'm the diksha guru of 5,000 ex-hippies. He never said that. My name is A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami. I'm the founder Acharya of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. That means for all time. The foundational spiritual master of ISKCON. And that's how we're all connected. And I always tell people, 
I've, I've already shared it with the people in attendance at the seminars. We only saw Srila Prabhupada, most of us, once a year, because he went 14 times around the world in 12 years. That means he'd swing by our part of the globe, you know, once a year on an average. And so we just had a little glimpse, just a little piece of Prabhupada's Leela. The full Prabhupada only emerges in the well-rounded Sangha of serious, sincere devotees who are following his Vani, his instructions, whatever generation. That's how the full Prabhupada emerges. So we would, you know, we would just get a little, a little glimpse, a little piece. Now at the press of a button, right, you can have Prabhupada, whatever he was doing. You have Prabhupada, you have the whole Veda base, you have the whole, uh, you have the sound and the video, you have the, the image and the sound of Prabhupada, what he was doing, his whole Vani. We, we, we would dream of that in the 70s. Wouldn't it be nice, Prabhu, if at the press of a button you knew what Prabhupada said about anything, anywhere, anytime? Now you can do that. So by the technology that Lord Chaitanya allowed to happen, it's every town, village, and device, right? Krishna consciousness is going. We can have Srila Prabhupada. So I heartily, warmly welcome you, invite you, encourage you if you can, come to some of the, it's going to be the weekend now, it's a little freer. We're going to be doing them uh, in the mornings, two lessons Saturday, two lessons Sunday, and then I'll give the last two on Tuesday and Wednesday evening, and we can discover more and more and more how we're all connected, all God families, all ethnic groups, all races, all generations, we're all vitally connected to Srila Prabhupada, who's the greatest manifestation of Lord Nityananda's mercy who ever walked this earth. Why? Because he spread Harinam, the length and breadth of this planet. Nobody ever did that. Okay, so how are we doing? 8.21. Do we have any more time? If we, if you, we have a little time. If you like to ask me, I don't allow this during the seminars. I insist the questions be about the points in the lesson. But if you want to ask me anything, please. Okay, we have a mic. Hare Krishna. Wait a minute. You gotta speak you gotta speak in American English. <laughs> Slowly. Okay. Which the <laughs> Well that's easy. Are you ready? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, 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 Hare Hare. Prabhupada called it Guru Parampara Radio. <laughs> it's coming from Krishna Loka. It's right in Narottam Das's song. Hare Hare Vipale. Right? We had a, a nice uh, popular version of it in English in the 60s and 70s. Uh, Hare Krishna came from Krishna Loka, because it's Goloka, Golokera Premadana Harinam Sankirtan. Ratina Jan Milo Kenitai. So, Hare Krishna came from Krishna Loka, but with this, with this chanting I have no connection. Day and night I am burning in this dark, lonely world without trying to make a correction. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, 
Hari Hari. I was imitating Prabhupada then. Prabhupada once stopped a Guru Puja by going like this. You know why? It was Chicago, 1974. He arrived at Guru Puja time at the temple. It was time for Guru Puja. Wherever Prabhupada landed, he just did what it was time for. Instantly adapted, no jet lag. Superhuman, totally beyond the bodily platform. I'm still recovering from traveling from Knoxville, Tennessee to Chicago, Illinois, to Doha, Qatar, to Calcutta, to Bangalore. <laughs> so, so Prabhupada sitting on the Vyasasana in Chicago, first time, first time a pure devotee had been in Chicago. Vivekananda had been there 81 years earlier at the World Parliament of Religions preaching Mayavad. 81 years later, a pure devotee finally had come to give her the, the Bhagavan realization, personal conception. So we were doing Guru Puja, and it was 74. So we had gone from the Swami step, very sedate, dignified, you know, the Swami step, right? But we had started going to India, and we started observing some of the Bengalis, you know, who can dance pretty wildly, vigorously. So you, you mix in wild Bengali dancing with 1960s rock and roll dancing. It was like a fusion, right? Of Bengali dancing with the boogaloo and the shingling and the African twist. <laughs> so Prabhupada, we're singing Guru Puja to him. And, he's, 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 and he, of course, he's singing Guru Puja to his Guru Maharaj, right? And then he opens his eyes and he sees us. And we're like boogieing, you know? It's like disco. <laughs> and Prabhupada's looking at us, you know, and we're like, you know. And he, he raises his hand and he, he drops his finger. In a nanosecond, the kirtan went from total pandemonium wild kirtan to pin drop silence in a boogie tableau. <laughs> that, was his, that was Prabhupada's power. And in that pregnant pause, Prabhupada knew how to use the pregnant pause. He gestures to a painting of Panchatattva behind us. And he says, in the Panchatattva, you know, arms raised. And he says, dance. Dance like Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. <laughs> and he goes like this. And, <laughs> <laughs> and we're animated again, but we're chastened. So we all start doing the Swami stuff. <laughs> oh, Prabhupada. And then um, he was there for Rathayatra down this big street called State Street in Chicago. And then it ended up in this place called the Civic Center. And I, I was lucky, I got a chance to ride on Subhadra Maharani's cart, because Prabhupada always rode in the middle cart, the protected cart, you know, Jagannath, Subhadra, Baladev. And so we were, some of us brahmacharis, we were up on top of the cart, Prabhupada was below us singing, and we were in the cart, and we were taking packets of peanuts and raisins prasadam. And we were throwing it to the throngs on the street. We were having a ball, you know, pitching these packets. And then it occurred to me, what I just shared with you, that 81 years earlier, in 1893, Vivekananda had come to Chicago and infamously has said, because he was invited, you know, by the World Parliament of Religions to represent so-called Hinduism. And so what was his so-called preaching? Uh, what is all this talk of God? I see so many gods loitering in the street before me. Daridra Narayan, the poor man is God, everybody's God, which infuriated the Western clerics. They thought, this is Hinduism? Everybody's God? So that was a first and lasting impression. And it's only because of Prabhupada's preaching that 
just now, that impression is turning toward personalism, Bhagavan. So I was thinking while I was on top of the cart, what's Prabhupada going to say? Is he going to say something to correct this misconception? So sure enough, the cart ends at Civic Center. Prabhupada sits on the cart. He stays there. A microphone is run up to him. And he says, uh, the first thing Prabhupada says, well, he says, thank, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, participating in this Ratha Yatra. And then he says, in the Vedanta Sutra, it is said, Janmad yasya yataha, the absolute truth is that from whom everything emanates. And he gives a pure personalism lecture to correct the record. <laughs> That's Srila Prabhupada. Okay, I see 8, 29, 31. We got 28 seconds left. <laughs> I'll just share with you one more thing. I only had one face-to-face -face exchange with Prabhupada because I was scared of Prabhupada. <laughs> totally scared. Totally loved Prabhupada on one level. Totally scared of him. That's why I kept my distance. But I did have one face-to-face -face exchange in Detroit when he initiated me. So, I don't know if you've heard these tapes, but Prabhupada, he would, he would chant around on your beads before he gave you your name. You ever seen the pictures with the beads on the microphone? Yeah. So Prabhupada would take a strand of beads and uh, then your name would be called. So someone called my name, Richard Hall. So, so then we'd all chant around. We got a lot of rounds done at these initiations. <laughs> so Prabhupada's, you know, he's there with that vigorous, deep, resonant japa, you yeah? know. Hari Krishna, Hari Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hari Hari, Hari Ram, Hari Ram, Ram Ram, Hari Hari, Hari Krishna, Hari Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hari Hari, Hari Ram, Hari Ram, Ram Ram, Hari Hari, Hari Krishna, Hari Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hari Hari, Hari Ram, Hari Ram, Ram Ram, Hari Hari. Sit properly. That's the fast tape. <laughs> I like the japa by example, you know, where Prabhupada's Hari Krishna, Hari Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hari Hari, Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari Hari. I can keep up with that. <laughs> so anyway, so Prabhupada, he gets all the way around on your beats, and then your name is called, and you, so I came up right about where you're, or I was kneeling in front of Srila Prabhupada. Now, when you look at Srila Prabhupada, you're looking at a person you can't even fathom what you're looking at because he's deeper than the ocean. These deep soul eyes, these deep brown soul eyes. It's like looking at the ocean. And at the same time, you've heard us say on the, on the, on the memories, oh, he was looking right through me. That's true. You felt like he was looking right through eons and lifetimes of karma right into you, into the soul. So, uh, I found the tape, actually, of the initiation. It's right, it's there. And so Prabhupada is saying, just as I remembered it. So he said, so your name is Sureshwara. It's the name of Brahma. It means controller of the demigods. So because my name means controller, Prabhupada did not want me to misunderstand that I was Brahma. Right? <laughs> You are Sureshwar Das, right? He really drew out the Das. Uh, so, you are a servant of the controller. Now, the whole time Prabhupada is saying this to me, you know, right like that, I'm like, you know, I'm totally stunned. It's like I'm stupefied because I'm, I can't fathom uh, how deep Prabhupada is and he's looking right through me. So, Prabhupada saw that I was stunned. So he took the beads he just chanted, and after explaining the name, he takes the beads. Do you have beads? Yeah, let me borrow your beads. So you come right, come a little closer. Let's borrow your beads. Okay. So he so go like this. So he said, he said, come on, take your beads. He's trying to snap me out of my stupor, you know. Come on, take your beads, come on. 
And then I took them and then I bowed down and then later I said, what's my name? You know, <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> so that's what it was like. It was a completely stunning experience. But Krishna had to send, I mean, Prabhupada, he couldn't just send those books that he translated. He knew that we had to have an example of someone who was living those books. And that's what it was like to be in Prabhupada's presence. It was, he was the living Bhagavatam, a living example of that. So he's our greatest example for all time, for all generations. We're all related to him. And that's how we're going to have the unity. We have so much diversity, especially when you go to Mayapur. You see people from China. Well, they're not actually going this year because of the coronavirus. <laughs> they're not allowed to come. But you see people from Europe and South America and Africa and, and so much diversity. So, but Prabhupada provides the unity amid that diversity. So let's all absorb ourselves in Prabhupada's everlasting Vani. Uh, appreciate him as the greatest representative of Lorna Chananda and especially on this day, beg Lorna Chananda's mercy that we can cooperate to bring Krishna consciousness to every town, village, device, and every person in the South Mangalore. Srila Prabhupada ki jai, Sri Nityananda Ram ki jai, Nitai go Premanandi. And then if I were Vaisheshika Prabhu, and then I'd say, Nitai go Hari Bo, Hari Bo. Hari Bo, Gora Hari Bo, Nitai Gor Hari Bo. Nitai Gor Hari Bo, Hari Bo, Hari Bo, Gor Hari Bo. Nitai Gor Hari Bo, Hari Bo. Hari Bo, Go Hari Bo. Sri La Prabhupada Ki Jai, Sri Nityananda Ram Ki Jai, Go Premanandi. Hare Krishna.